Well, hey, it's Ryan and Amanda Cook, and I got the privilege of catching Amanda in her day down in L.A. So thanks for taking a few moments with us, Amanda. Yes, you're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Love it. Amanda, I remember the last time that I had a chance to talk with you. It was on Instagram Live, and for some reason, I double booked myself, and I was in the middle of a golf game the 14th hole, but I was like, I have to take this call with Amanda. So I butted out, missed a couple of holes, crawled down by a bush somewhere, stuck my phone out there and thought, how am I going to make this conversation work? And it was such a beautiful connection that I remembered having with you. I mean, we're both Canadians. Go Canada, go. Hey, I love. uh... (laughs) And then we both have Mennonite Brethren Roots, which is our sort of cultural faith background. And, That's a whole, uh, whole world within a world as well. <laughs> I know, totally is. So much is about faith and community and church, but then something so important to me is the food, the smells, the people, the family gatherings, all of that, that uh, just is a part of my whole faith experience, and I'm sure. And then I think I heard that you grew up on a farm as well, I did. didn't you? Yes, so I now I didn't technically grow up in a farm, but uh, I, I I guess I sort of did. It was a 10 acre blueberry farm. We had cows, oh. sheep, you know, dogs, chickens. Yeah, I guess I grew up on a farm. There's there's something about growing up in that kind of space that just gives you a sense of memory as a as a child, a sense of connectedness, groundedness. Tell me a little bit about that. What was life like for Amanda Cook as like a yeah. five year old? growing up in what Manitoba, Canada? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, it was spacious. I, yes. spacious, but I think what it set me up for is what I rely on now a lot when it comes to my um, faith tradition and orthodoxy. I'd say I learned a lot. I'd learn kind of primary connection um, with God through watching my um, struggle and and return to gratitude every day because wow. their entire life was based on something that was completely outside of their control, which is the weather. Hmm. And I, yeah, that kind of dependency and trust at an early age because we absorb things at that age. We don't. We're not necessarily locking it away in a in a conscious way. It's all unconscious. We're mm-hmm. paying attention, absorbing everything. So I think learning that, watching my dad you know, um, you just have to be yielded. There's no other choice. Otherwise, Mm. you're just, you descend into misery. So either you have a faith that holds you together that you return to at the end of the night, especially since Manitoba is quite a bleak landscape for, you Mm -hmm. know, it has winter for like months of the year. (laughs) Yeah, There's a beauty to that kind of bleak, you know, nature. It forces you to have to go inward and it forces you to have to find other methods of expressing yourself like music and art and literature. And so I think as far as growing up on a farm, I picked up on a lot of inward practices that I didn't know that I was picking up on um, Mm. by watching my parents practice them outwardly as a form of necessity and survival. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, learning that we're seasonal beings or it's in our nature to live as seasonal beings, that there's a natural death and resurrection that happens in our cells while we're sleeping every night, that being able to see that play out on a large scale, on a grand scale, you know, under like the mm-hmm. Northern Light, things like that, mm-hmm. really to the landscape, all of us, you know, absorb a landscape for our faith, but that gave me a real visual landscape for things that we sometimes, you know, distill into ideas about God or faith or seasonal living. I got to see it firsthand and I got to be immersed in it in a Mm -hmm. way. So yeah, it was wild. It was a, it was a wild and, you know, spacious and full of its own grit and its beauty and challenge. And uh, everybody's got their, you know, their, the makings of themselves. And even though I just described it as entirely picturesque, which it was, there's, it's always the flip side of the coin too. It's both. And there's, you know, an intense struggle and for survival that our ancestors went through that is still Mm -hmm. prevalent in the dominant conscious in the dominant like unconscious mind of it so Mm -hmm. we 
Yeah, it was. Uh, now I've been learning language for that and therapy and, you know, <laughs> and finding articulation. It's like what Mr. Rogers says, you know, anything mentionable becomes manageable. It feels like a yeah. relief. Yeah. They hear something said that brings understanding so that we don't feel so alone so then we actually can see through the fog of whatever it is that we were trying yeah. to trying to figure out but couldn't on our own so yeah yeah it was it was a full hmm. it was a full for sure i bet you that's something that you and i share is our grandparents were the ones that well my grandparents anyways i won't speak for you but my grandparents came over from europe uh where life was so difficult and you know boarded a ship and that's the whole story of when the Mennonites came and landed in Canada, as well as other areas around the world. But uh, there were different settlements and mm -hmm. I feel like my own deep inner core and character is shaped by the struggle that they persevered through and then passed on to my own parents. And then the struggle they had, which is one generation, you know, moved. And then and I'm even passing that on to my kids because I've had tremendous struggle. I know you have as well in your own life. I mean, we all have in our own stories of that and, 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 you know, passing it forward like that. So tremendous. Yeah. Um, but what is it like now you're in LA? So that's a, a grand contrast. How do you like, tell me about what are some of the positives and some of the challenges that it is of living in LA versus your early years in Manitoba in the wide open winter? <laughs> this is a great, you. First of all, I just love these questions so much. Okay. Um, thank you. They're different. They're different questions that I'm often yeah. asked, and I appreciate that. Um, I mean, LA. I think there's this. It's a landscape. I I love Final Frontiers. I think that's something hmm. that I I loved since I can remember. It was the idea of God being a final frontier. Music feels like a final frontier. I like being a small fish in a big pond. I like feeling the scale of things, the size of things. I like standing next to the ocean and and feeling small. So I, it does feel like a contrast, but there's some sort of strange similarity to the feeling that I get um, with mm. that kid and I would, I would, you know, we'd be working at harvest and I'd take the ATV and kind of drive out and then just go watch the Northern Lights for a bit. It's the same mm -hmm. feeling, the different mm -hmm. maybe for me. And I do return to nature uh, over and over and over again. I find that that is, that is a recipe for sanity um, mm -hmm. to, you know, I'm in driving distance of the ocean. And mm -hmm. that was a big decision. That was a big deciding factor for me in, in deciding that I wanted to be in LA it was, well, I, I, this is my chance to live as close to the ocean as I want to. I might as well, you know, I need the sunshine. It's really good for my mental health and I have some really good friends here. So those, those were the three deciding factors as far as deciding on Southern California. I've always loved California, but mm -hmm. I have a particular affinity for Southern Cal California and for kind of the wild nature that it is mm -hmm. in every sort of way. Um, you kind of can find whatever you're looking for um, in LA to, to your blessing and your detriment. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a very, and so it's been mm -hmm. really, really, good. it's been a city that I feel like has loved me very, very well. Huh. I needed, I needed sunshine, you know, every morning I needed a good reset, um, for where I was at in my development and mm -hmm. through my dark soul, I huh. needed a reminder, like a, a morning was coming, even mm -hmm. if I didn't believe. It. So mm -hmm. that's, has been to me i feel like i get really moved by weather quite easily again hmm. i think my upbringing so it's i try to put myself out into the world um into the weather rather mm -hmm. as quick as I can in the morning now i'm returning to some of those rituals as i did as a kid when i would i would just live to go be outside as soon as i could in the morning and and that's that's something that i've carried forward now into my late 30s is if i can just put myself outside in the weather no matter hmm. what the weather is you know there's some weathers that i don't for not yeah. to be involved with but like <laughs> but yeah it's an it's an automatic reset it puts me in touch with god it puts me in touch with my own soul it's it's a great way hmm. to start the day well, yeah I think so i love some of these love some of these stories you're sharing is just a great background to the music that you make because your music is 
like it's so captivating. I, I want to tell you an experience I had this morning with your music. I was preparing for this time uh, to talk with you. And so I, I put my headphones on. I came in my office sitting right here at this desk and started listening to these songs. And I just found like myself swept away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I had a guest come over and another one of our staff, they came in the office, they're chatting away in behind me, but I have my headphones on. And so life is going on there. And then my wife came in the office. I was oblivious to it all. And then they're like, um, Ryan, what's happening to you? <laughs> You're just like in another world. And I took my headphones off and it was like, I don't know, the world just changed. You, your music, it's just, mm -hmm. it's so soul capturing and um and it's nice to know some of your personhood like the the humanity that has gone on in behind as you were as a child and then you know kind of working through your seasons of life so uh, i start to kind of get it a little bit more i'd like to take a few minutes to talk through some of these songs and there's one theme word that i caught from reading a little about you and i'm wondering if you could weave that through as we talk about these songs and that's the word honesty that mm. you have felt like you wanted to bring some honesty to the table for songs that we sing or songs that you write can you tell me as we look at some of these songs i'm going to show a few lyrics here and and i want to know what that means for you that means a lot to me mm. listening to these and feeling like i can connect i can relate i don't have to pretend Think that's what mm. people are looking for today yeah. so give me a little intro oh, window into that and then i'll look at a few of these songs with you um i love that i mean i think that the baseline for any human connection and especially if we're going to talk about being I mean, you know i think practiced spirituality the form that religion is meant to serve is is the is the connection and the integration of a whole human being it's so i think honesty is a baseline it's the intro to any healthy human connection you don't have that you don't have a relationship mm -hmm. and um, designed for relationship we relate to god ourselves and the world you know in so many different ways and so i think for me music because i didn't have articulation for emotional or mental health or the landscape of a of a human soul music always felt like the place that i that I would find out what I actually needed or wanted or was struggling with. It was the place of bare honesty for me. And it not even lyrically, I, piano was the first instrument. Music was the mm -hmm. first language that made sense to me. And it gave me this access. It would unlock things for me in my mind and my heart and my emotions. And so honesty to me has always been first and foremost. We always start from that place. Um, and then in the crafting of a song, we end up wanting to serve the greater good in the public service of art so honesty for honesty's sake only gets us so far mm -hmm. and having a place to confess and to admit things i think is is a private and a sacred space there's like that's some of that is reserved for a trusted few right mm -hmm. people that are companions that are friends that are mentors that are therapists that are running with me when it comes to the alchemy of music what i want is to preserve the honest space that a song came from but I want it to ultimately serve the greater good of someone else's story. The artist mm -hmm. needs to disappear into the work for that to happen. And so there's a part of the honesty that's preserved and the vulnerability that's preserved in any good work. But by the time it reaches someone's ears, it needs to not be about Amanda's story anymore. It right. needs to be about her story, right? It needs yeah. to be about, it's that's the public service of art and music is that we listened to something and we felt like someone reached into our own soul and told us what mm -hmm. was happening. Mm -hmm. And we're like, Know that I feel less alone you know it's mm -hmm. the companionship of art and and music so honesty to me has always been the the starting point the baseline and we preserve like the vulnerability of it while we craft it into something that hopefully can turn medicinal it can it can be helpful for other people and mm -hmm. applicable to other people's stories not just my own mm -hmm. um, yeah and it's the baseline of prayer right I, the older I get, the lesser my words are when it comes to prayer, because mm. I notice how much energy I've given over my life to trying to say the right thing to God. Mm. And 
the idea of God, right? This idea in my head about God will determine how I approach that idea of God. And so as that idea of God changes and it evolves and it grows and it turns in, you know, more, it reveals itself more as he's a healthy parent. You know, Jesus is the great revealer of who this God actually is. And he says that he called him father. You know, like there's, as that gets revealed, there's a lot less rhetoric involved and a lot less religious um, mm-hmm. mental traffic for me that I used mm-hmm. to navigate. I would try to like approach this being, you know, mm-hmm. and there's a book helped me by Anne Lamott. I love, I adore Anne Lamott and it's called Help, Help, Thanks, Wow. Oh, and wow. she basically but she says every single prayer that she has ever prayed, whether it's lots of words or no words, can all be summed up into those three words, help, thank, mm-hmm. and wow. Mm-hmm. And we're into the spaciousness and the energy of turning our whole beings towards God, which is what Henry Nouwen talks about in his book, The Way of the Heart. He talks about how, you know, in our Western society, talking about the heart has become kind of the seat of the emotions, but in our scripture, in our orthodoxy, um, when the word heart was discussed, it meant turning all of your energy and all of your faculty towards God. So all of your mm-hmm. mental energy, emotional, psychological, spiritual, physical, um, it meant moving all of those parts towards God in order to be reintegrated. And mm-hmm. so the prayers, yeah, the prayers that I end up praying now feel like very simple. Um, There's a prayer my friend told me about the other day that I loved that I'm putting into practice, which is every morning he wakes up and he he brings himself before God and he gives God both his desire for good and his desire for evil. Hmm. And it cuts off at the pass and it keeps the conversation open during the Mm -hmm. day and it allows him to offload and admit, you know, both those things live within me. Both Mm -hmm. those longings get distorted if under the wrong influence so i want to be influenced by the goodness of god right Mm -hmm. because the longings are pure but when we bring our long when we when we sequester ourselves away when we isolate ourselves with our longings that's when there's an op there's an option for deception which then leads to distortion which Mm -hmm. leads to disordered desires i'm just very i'm basically Mm -hmm. paraphrasing john mark Mm -hmm. homer about he Mm -hmm. he talks about i think his book is called live no lies and it's incredible but Mm -hmm. um Basically, to bring it back to honesty, I think like yeah. honesty for um, expression sake, which is good, that needs to happen in really important safe spaces like a greenhouse where you can grow and be tended to. And then there's greater honesty, which is about sharing a story when it's the right time in hopes that it would serve someone else's story. The point is not mm-hmm. just that my story would be heard in the public arena. Because it actually has been heard in the private sector now. I feel I'm. I feel tended to. I feel loved. I feel companioned. I feel parented. You know. So mm-hmm. when I share in honesty in the public space, I'm not looking for people at that point then to validate it because it has mm-hmm. been validated. So mm-hmm. then it actually it can scatter and it can become like medicinal seeds to people. Mm-hmm. You know, we all know what that feels like to be in the presence mm-hmm. of someone that who has done their work and has been to their own therapy and has gone through their own dark night as a soul and comes out the other side and has been witnessed in such a degree that they feel so complete and so loved and when they actually offer their story to the world it's not them trying to heal themselves through the approval Mm -hmm. of other people at that point Mm -hmm. it's actually being able to share something Mm -hmm. and invite people into their own their own process their own journey their own healing Mm -hmm. if that makes I just feel like so much of what you're saying could be applied to all worship leaders, like, because we want to get on the stage and we want to be honest and authentic, but you're bringing like a new perspective on this, that, that it's not to sort of reveal some personal thing that is about my story in particular, even as a worship leader, even if I'm singing your song or someone else's song, (laughs) but uh, finding a way to, to still convey that authentic confidence and rest and yet not you know falseness or pretense or something yeah like that. yeah i think i think i'm passionate about healing the cognitive dissonance because that's what has been part of my healing journey is this idea <laughs> that you have to say everything to god in front of other people in order to feel honest mm-hmm. um and 
things, certain songs that we don't fully believe. And I'm, mm -hmm. and to me, there's some sort of alternative path within that. And I've, I think I just got thrown into the practice of it, really. But it's the psalmist practice where, I mean, we get to read his journal entries. So we get to see how scathing his review actually was of <laughs> the world and his enemies mm -hmm. and his ideas. You know? And then at the end of it, he would bring his soul back around. He would, because he'd been honest, he could bring his soul back around. That is the only way to actually bring your soul back around is to understand it and look at the areas in which it's hurting and which is in pain mm -hmm. and in trauma. To then be able to gather up your soul like a parent, like a healthy parent and go, okay, we're going to center ourselves. We're going to take all of this. We're going to include all of this. And we're going to take it all into the goodness of God together. Mm -hmm. We're not mm -hmm. it behind. We're actually bringing it all to him because he's the mm -hmm. one who can heal. And so I think even for worship leading or like the form of that in music or whatever that would look like, there were days where mm -hmm. I would bring appointment to God and I would pick a song that was spacious enough that I felt had a shred of believability to my brain because you have to have that I'm like okay so maybe I can't sing about all the you know promises coming true because it doesn't feel like that right now but can I sing greater you Lord yes because that mm -hmm. song just that song centers and anchors us in in a in a spacious reality that's again words are few it's so simple it's a song that has sustained me for the better part of 10 15 years i'm not sure yeah. when it came out literally since it came out and yeah. i never get to sing that because it holds all of my energy and all of my stories they're mm -hmm. all tucked in every time i sing it so i've sung it with with uh, like i make a commitment right before i go on stage to be honest in my energy towards god that doesn't mean that i have to um, explain it to people. It means that I bring it with me, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll never forget when I was starting to move through stages of grief, there was one time where I just got, I was so fatigued in basically realizing that the only thing that I felt like I could keep bringing to God was my disappointment in him. <laughs> <laughs> disappointment in myself and in life and how everything was shaking down, everything was turning out and bringing that honesty internally, right? This is all an internal dialogue too. Once yeah. we figure that, like it's not, saying something out loud doesn't make it more true. There's mm -hmm. a different part of that that we need that's a whole other flip side of the coin that that is an essential part of healing. But there's an inner dialogue of a quick decision that can be made that looks like me going, I hate this. I hate that what I'm bringing you is actually how disappointed I am in you. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna sing a song in spite of it, because I hmm. think it might be true regardless of what I believe now, but I'm mad. And hmm. hearing, hearing the dialogue, hearing the otherly thought, because we're in this conversation with the divine, right? We're in this communion with God, hearing God very clearly. There's only, you know, it's, it's all internal, so it's all interpretation. So please interpret it as you will. But what I felt like I heard was, thank you for trusting me with this. Hmm. That's Thank what the Lord was saying to you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for trusting me with your disappointment. It's hmm. precious to me. Hmm. It's precious to me. It's mm -hmm. valuable to me. It's treasure to me. What you think mm -hmm. is less than is not lesser than. It's the fact that you're here and you trust hmm. me. That's amazing. Hmm. Let's go. And hmm. I just realized I was like, that that keeps the line open. Like anything to keep the line open. There's just, we just, I think we're, on the cusp, I think we've always been on the cusp, and Jesus revealed all this, that our, that this this God that Jesus introduces us to is an unoffendable God. It's the God that you can beat your fist into mm. his chest. He's going to absorb the blows. Why? Because he did, because that's what Jesus did already on the cross. That's the view that we have of God, is this spaciousness and this inclusivity and this radical rooted person who is anxious for nothing. Um, he, you know, and so experiencing that kind of God, that kind of, that kind of um, spaciousness and that kind of warmth and that kind of belonging. I mean, that, that has healing properties to it, right? Without trying mm -hmm. that is healing. It has a medicinal quality. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I'm way off topic at this point, but I think the cognitive dissonance part for me, I'm really passionate about because mm -hmm. I think sometimes we go, we have to believe everything about God or, we sh or we're not allowed to be here. That's not true. None of us know what we're talking about half the time when it comes <laughs> to God. We're all yeah. 
about the way it really? feels. It's a lot that we don't know most things. Can we admit that? Let's start yeah. there. Let's start with the humility of that, right? So take the pressure off of you have to know everything theologically that there is to know about God. Because first of all, you won't. That's what eternity is for. And <laughs> and that's that's an internal revelation. I don't think we get to whatever the other side looks like and suddenly know all things. I think mm -hmm. it's a progressive relationship. Like the mm -hmm. tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's a whole other conversation. But in church yesterday, we were talking about like how God, pro this is me just thinking out loud, yeah. that perhaps God wasn't hiding things from people. He was hiding things for the development of, of the human heart, that as the human heart grew in capacity with relationship with him, that things would be revealed over time. Hmm. And the enemy always likes shortcuts. That's what the, the talk yesterday was about. It was so profound. He was like, the hmm. enemy actually, he questions, he has you question the motivation of God is God actually truly concerned with my good, with the goodness and with my happiness? He has this question that first, and then he 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 sees our desire, and he wants to give us a shortcut to it, right? Mm -hmm. When God is more agricultural, it's about living and dying and being reborn. It's about mm -hmm. taking time. It's about there not being any rush. It's about things being revealed over a lifetime, you know. And so I think as far as cognitive dissonance goes, like we've we've put so much pressure on all on us to try to know everything there is to know, first of all, that we won't ever about God. All we get is all we see is in part we see Jesus and we follow Jesus and we listen to Jesus and we return to Jesus and we and we keep letting him save us. We're being salvation all the way through. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you take the pressure off of that, it allows you to go and sing one song about God, about a God that is mysterious, but that is clear through Jesus. And it allows you to bring exactly who you are into the energy of the song, into the energy of the music without having to even spill it out over a bunch of people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, hmm. that's, that's Beautiful. the baseline for me. It's, I know that was a very long answer, but it's it's a good question to think about. Well, because... Amanda, I feel like if I just ask you the right question, you just you just get uh, you get all swelled up with so many thoughts, and I can hear the uh, the liter the literism coming through the way you speak. You, it's almost like you speak in a song. You've got uh, alliteration mm -hmm. and and rhythm, and and uh, there's songs that could come out of just this conversation so uh, it's so beautiful i do want to look at a couple of songs so yeah um we'll we'll do that for a few minutes here i'm realizing oh there you are so so this is your album it's on praise charts which of course we've got lots of your all your music that you ever write <laughs> always finds its way to praise charts but i okay. i thought i would look at this song found first uh so i i made the lyrics nice and big oh looks like it was uh, a little bit over let me bring it over like this so that you can see it but can we just sort of um tell me a little bit about the writing of that song and let's try to bring in a few of these thoughts about how honesty sort of made its way through your life and then sort of came out in these lyrics that can become the story of other people to you know to connect with and engage with can you just give us a little window into this i mean the window into that song is it's so sim it's so simple i yeah. think it feels anchoring to me um it is one of those things that i uh that anchors I, me to the to the to the basic truth of like i've i've gone on all these little adventures and journeys and the people that I wrote it with, we've all had these experiences and these journeys and these ideas and these thoughts, but it all comes back to Jesus. It's all just mm -hmm. ended up, you know, at the end of the day, bringing us back to a, a, a deeper and brighter and bigger and better revelation of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's that it's very simple language. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what I love about it the most. I guess in some ways it can reflect, perhaps this is part of your story. If you're writing a song about, you know, I found it, it does somewhat passively reflect your story of, I have looked in other places and discovered yeah. that it's not there. And, yes. and yet I can sing this song or engage with, or as I was this morning, just 
you know, enveloped in listening to the song, but it became now part of my story. Is this the final that. thing, treasure that we're looking for? So it does make sense. Uh, I'm just going to flow through a couple songs here. So here's Rest. Um, and, and this is, yeah, straight from that scripture about, um, you know, your burden is light. And uh, I'm sure you have your own stories of feeling that sense of burden, but then creating a peace that is for those who are weary. Tell us about that. I mean, yeah, I, this is where I feel like I actually run out of words. I'm like, it's all in the uh, song, but yeah. the idea of you know, him, he's never going to run out of strength and he's never going to run out of, out of patience. And I've really been yeah. looking at patience, taking a long walk around the idea of patience these days because I'm really impacted by it. It's not, patience is not passivity and it, it is not dissociation. It's not just waiting around um, for something to happen. It's active presence. It is, and when you're with a patient person, they're fully invested in, in watching the unfolding of your, of your process, of your actual life. They don't take a trip around the room in their brain and, and check out or disappear into their mind. Mm -hmm. They stay. And that to me is such an incredible, I'm so moved by that, the staying mm -hmm. power. Is. And the idea of like God, I mean, yeah, God doesn't run out of patience. And it doesn't mean that he's just waiting for us to finally figure something out. Like that's not the energy behind it. The energy mm -hmm. behind patience is like a loving awareness and anticipation that sh she's going to get to exactly where she needs to go. And I'm here for that. And I'm going to mm -hmm. celebrate it along the way. I'm going to grieve with her along the way. We're going to walk together. We're going to sit in silence together. We're going to be together. She's going to know that I'm with her the entire way through. That to me, oh, that, yeah, he doesn't run out of patience. Yeah. I mean, beautiful. Yeah, that's it. Can you, uh, just as we kind of close here, but I want to ask, I'm always interested in, in the relationships or the people that you write with on a project like this. I'm sure there were n numerous ones, but could you just maybe tell us about one or two meaningful moments that you had in coming together in your community and, and writing some songs here. Just, just pick yeah. one or two as examples. Um, I mean, it's beautiful. There's the writing of it and the writing rooms themselves are really stunning because we, they're a collection of songs. I tend to collect songs. I don't really do writing camps as much. I, I tend yeah. to just go and write with one or two people at a time and walk away with thought and let that simmer for a while. <laughs> And then there's the there's the the skeleton versions of songs, and I work with Jason Ingram on, and yeah. Jason, my principal collaborator when it comes to this, he um, for you know a decade has been my uh, co-writer. He's like your big brother. <laughs> I All watch him on social media when Amanda <laughs> comes out with this with an album. He is like, hey, look what my sister I mean, did. Like, we <laughs> yeah. all we all it's love beautiful. Jason. We yeah. all every that gets to work with him we all feel so similarly about that i think he's just he again he's a patient he's a really patient person to the creative process and he cares about people more than the songs and he always has i can't talk enough about jason ingram um, and everyone agrees i just know that so i love that and i love celebrating people um and then on this particular project we got um a few of our musician friends who are just some of the best that I've ever played with in a room together for two days and we got to riff off of each other. So we walked in with the songs, um, just a skeleton version of it and we didn't give them too much time with it. I really loved this and learned this by watching Jason work um, in that capacity where he wants, he's always leaning into um, the sum of the parts that when the people show up in the room, the project will reveal itself. Mm -hmm. And so we got together and we got to, you know, to spend time together. The relational quality always makes music better in my mind. And we spent the whole day together and we would send them into the studio after listening to it twice and charting it out and go, okay, like play your first idea, play your first interpretation, play, you know, let's, let's just see what's there, what's in the ether. And so Cassie Campbell, who's a dear friend of mine, she's a bass player. And she plays, I mean, she it's she she needs to do a whole album of her playing bass. I don't know if I would say that about most bass players, but her <laughs> the way she 
he plays, it's a complete thought. It's a complete mm. instrument. That instrument holds all of her stories and all of her history and all of her mm. hopes and all of her prayers and all of her dreams, all of her disappointments. It's incredible. So it's so spacious. I remember she mm. played on Steph's album, um, a bass solo. It's a solo track. Um, and all of us sat there weeping, listening to her play it when she was recording that. So having her there was a dream. Um, Dan McMurray, who drums on it, is so, he's so clever. He's so intuitive. He, he, he's intuitive. It's an intuitive thing. I feel very picky about rhythms and polyrhythms. And so sometimes I get into the weeds a little bit with drummers going like, can you try this? Can you try this? Can we try mm -hmm. this? And we run out of options. He just always has another, another gear to go into. And mm. E played guitar. Um, I mean, he was, he's, first of all, the most tender heart, most tender heart, pure hearted. And also, again, up for doing things in an unconventional way. We, we got a bow and we're like, can you play your electric guitar with this bow and just yeah. see what happens? And that's the magic of the music at the oh, end of Found yeah. was locating the sound and this kind of siren sort of experience. It's like mm -hmm. almost like a wall, wall vibe that usually for me, like writing lyrics, the lyrics always have to bend towards the music. The music needs to take over because that to me is where the spaciousness is. That's where mm. people get to have experiences. So I always lean towards that in anything that we create. So having that moment was stunning mm. and i mean the whole team the whole team our engineer like i mean everybody was so mm -hmm. beautiful my creative creative uh administrative partner and assistant came to and just hosted all of us so it really was a family environment and i think that's felt when mm. you listen back to it well now it, now that you're yeah. saying all this it it makes sense why i was lost in my headphones this morning because truly and if uh, those of you who are listening if you haven't listened yet it it sounds different it sounds like there's there's things i haven't heard instruments played like this before and it and it's so woven together but like sonically it will i don't know it will capture your heart and um and it makes sense now now that you're saying all the stories and the people now i'm gonna mm -hmm. listen again and listen for that bass or listen for the drums and i appreciate how you are in tune with, because I know you're very skilled on the piano, so you understand obviously theory and all the magnitude of music and um, that you care about oh, those things. So yeah. I, now that I'm talking about everybody, I'm like, I got to keep going. Joe Williams. Okay. okay. Celebrate <laughs> for a because he's, he's a counterpart that we've worked with together for years. Jason and I will work on the skeleton version of a song and then we'll throw it to Joe and it always comes back. It's one of those things in collaboration, which is, it mesmerizes me is that when you mm. send it get out and it comes back to you better and someone mm -hmm. else thought about things that you wouldn't have been able to access. It's just like mm -hmm. how we look at talk, right? When you start talking about it with people, then the idea comes back to you better because in community, we discover things, shared experiences lead us to different discoveries and different revelations. So Joe has always been that. He's always brought perspective musically that rounds out the whole picture that um, there's like a warmth and a depth and kind of almost a darkness to it in the best way. All those like mm -hmm. mid range sounds um, and bass sounds low end. He's just unbelievably phenomenal. So mm -hmm. anyways, I think I, I covered the main, yeah. I don't know. I we, we apologize if there's anyone missed that got missed in this, but uh, we hear your heart and you're clearly a person who loves community, loves the people that you work with and, and, um, and this project, while it's your voice and your name on the, on the front, this is, this is uh, not only your community, but it's like, it's a part of your history, even as you yeah. I feel like we went back to the beginning, you know, talking about just the wonder and uh, of, of your experience as a child out on the field or on the quad or all of that stuff. And and I appreciate as well that I don't hear you, you, you don't carry a, um, I don't know what to say other than like, like a bitterness towards some past religious experience or even, you know, our Mennonite brethren roots, which some people are like, Oh, they just want to leave all of that, and I, I personally feel like I want to capture and carry forward all of the goodness and just 
give grace to, you know, I mean, my grandpa was a very religious man, but deep in his heart, he was so tender, so broken, so humble. And I, that's the part that I want to carry forward and just honor that and mm, let go of some of the, the rest. Right. So that's beautiful. Okay, Amanda. Well, I think we might have to chop this up into a couple of different interviews. I don't know who's going to stick with us for uh, 55 minutes, but I yeah. was. So <laughs> I was happy to hear it all and so grateful for your tender honesty and uh, in sharing the, the story of your life and these songs with us. So thank you. We're going to having me and thank you for this conversation it was really lovely i love yeah it was i know every time that i i speak to you i feel like a you know long lost sister so uh Aww. we are so sisters sweet. and uh, brothers appreciate you a lot hope you have a thank great you. day in la thank you. Thank <laughs> okay you. god bless you amanda see you then you too. bye